Welcome to the Fit Click, home of the best in fitness and entertainment. Here's your host, Chris Doherty. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Fit Click episode 57. I'm Chris, and today I welcome a professional golfer on the European Tour who has already won twice this season at the ripe young age of 26. Like my previous guest, Dylan Gambardella, from last Tuesday, my guest today is a graduate of Duke University and just this past August won the Made in Denmark tournament for his first European Tour victory. There he is with the trophy right there. And uh, today we discuss the mindset and routine of winning and how you can apply it to any sport or industry, no matter your role or title. There he is flexing, of course. We are a fitness show after all. <laughs> and uh, today I would like to welcome Julian Suri to the Fit Click. What's going on, Julian? Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm fantastic. Thanks for joining me with your very busy schedule that I know you have. And, um, you know, we, we got a lot of that stuff we're going to talk about today. But my very, very first question I ask every guest on the show is what gets you amped up each and every day to be who you are and do what you do? I mean, for me, my motivation is is pretty much getting the best out of myself. I, I, I've, I've always looked up to athletes like Kobe Bryant and obviously Tiger Woods. And, and I remember Kobe once said, you know, if, if you kind of view your potential as like an orange and his personal goal throughout his career was to kind of squeeze and get as much juice out of that orange as he could. And once he was done, he could just step away comfortably and say, look, I squeezed every little bit out of myself that I could. And so for me, it's, it's about improving and it's about the progress. When I see progress, I'll do whatever it takes because the progress is the most kind of addicting feeling to feel like you came away from some sort of practice session or training session in the gym or whatever, feeling like you got better and you're closer to achieving your goals. Uh, that's what kind of gets me up in the morning. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you've also had a lot of success too. And, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get into the whole, you know, trail of events that have happened over the last four or five months or so. They've been very, very exciting for you, but you're competing now, like I said, on the European tour. Uh, you were also playing earlier this year on the challenge tour, which, um, for the Americans, that's the equivalent of the buy.com, <laughs> buy web.com. It used to be the buy.com. Um, and, you know, you're American yourself. You're playing over there in Europe. You played at Duke. And, you know, I guess I could say similar to U.S. Open champion Brooks Kepka right now, who also played in Europe before he came over here and had a lot of success. Um, you know, kind of describe for me, if you can, you know, why Europe after college? Um, you know, what's the ultimate goal for you professionally with all the things that you're after right now? Um, I mean, I'd say why Europe, you, you know, it, it wasn't like an immediate thing after I finished up college, you know, I finished up in, in the spring of 2013. And, and I, uh, you know, I, I, there were a couple of years, I was kind of struggling with my game, I was here, I was playing mini tours all around the US, I did a bunch of web, web.com Monday qualifiers, I even did the Q school here. Um, and, uh, and I made it into a couple web events, I made the cut in one in uh, last summer in Kansas, missed the cut and won in Tennessee a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, I, I thought I basically I felt like good golf is good golf wherever you tee it up. And, you know, based on being able to kind of travel and see the world and experience different conditions. Um, I had a good buddy at the time who fresh out of out of college, uh, Brinson Paolini, another Duke guy um, who had really done very well in Europe his first two years out of college. and got his, his European tour card fairly quickly. And, and, you know, just the things he was seeing really appealed to me. I mean, just being able to – I mean, you can set your own schedule, do whatever you want. You, you're traveling all over the world. I mean, there's so many people that would kill for that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that part really appealed to me. And, and uh, like I said, once I felt like my golf game was ready to, to play anywhere, um, I felt like it was a pretty natural decision. And we kind of talked about – but before we got started here, um, I was early this morning, as I'm sure you probably were too, or I think you were practicing, but I was watching the little PGA Tour live and watching the Tour Championship. While you're enjoying the trek in Europe right now, and, and who couldn't with those beautiful courses, and obviously you've had some success, but um, is the ultimate goal to get to the PGA Tour and also into the FedEx Cup? Yeah, you know, I think being able to play all the top events in the world is, is, is definitely the goal and play against the top competition. Like I said, I want to keep improving and challenge myself professionally and and I think, uh, you know, the PGA Tour is where it's at. Um, that being said, I, I still do enjoy traveling. I think, I think it'd be a pretty cool thing to have, uh, have status on both tours and, and make, be a, truly a, a global golfer. I saw a, um, uh, about a month ago when I was going to Denmark from, from the U.S., I was on a plane and I was watching 
this documentary about Gary Player, and it was uh, just over an hour or so, and it was kind of saying, <clears throat> you know, how obviously times were different back then when he played, but it was how committed he was to traveling and to um, even even after he won all his majors and he was playing on the senior tour and senior events, he still was so dedicated to kind of growing the game globally. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a really cool aspect of our job that, uh, you know, that, that I can kind of pursue. Gary Player, he's, he's long been one of me and my father's favorites. And uh, I know he's the spokes guy for the golf hall of fame now. And, I think arguably the, maybe not even arguably the greatest bunker player of all time. I don't know if uh, (laughs) you have an opinion on that, but uh, certainly you look at the international influence as we have the president's cup coming up in just over a week and um, you know, what the, what the Ryder cup has done for the game. I mean, you know, kind of talk about the dichotomy between the U S tour and the European tour and what they've really meant together for the, for the game of golf. Yeah. You know, I think, I think uh, obviously everybody over here knows about the PGA tour and, and the European tour, over here, I think to most golf fans, um, is kind of mostly brought up either during the Ryder Cup or when European guys contend in the majors. Mm-hmm. But over there, um, everybody knows about the PGA Tour, obviously as well as the European Tour. They all pay attention week in and week out, and and uh, they're honestly just as passionate, very educated over there. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think it, it is they they play some really cool places, really cool courses. Um, and uh, honestly, the standard is, is great. It, you know, as far as um, I think all the top events over there, are, I think can be fairly comparable to, to the top events over here. Um, so, you know, I, I've had a blast doing it. And, and uh, you know, but obviously, as, as I want to progress, I want to make Ryder Cup teams and President's Cups teams, like you said, and compete against the best players in the world. The only way I get points is if I join the PGA Tour. So that's uh, definitely on the horizon for sure. What's the, this is kind of a loaded question, but what would you say is the biggest difference between playing on a golf team in college like you did and now competing on your own? I would say, um, you know, I'd say it's mostly off the course stuff. I think, uh, you know, just having to take care of, obviously you have a team now, uh, you know, whether it's management and coach, like a swing coach or, uh, you know, whatever fitness guy. And, uh, but most of it is just, you know, primarily you're still traveling by yourself and you're, you're taking care of the little things. I had a, um, a bad stretch off the golf course earlier in the summer where my clubs, there was some sort of delay, uh, four weeks in a row. And, uh, thanks to the airlines and whatever travel difficulties and, (laughs) and, you know, just having to deal with stuff where you're in different countries at different airports having to deal with people when you've had a long week, this is Monday morning and English might not be their first language. You're trying to still say civil and not be the uh, ignorant American who <laughs> yells at the first sight of anything, but also try to get your clubs. Cause you're kind of sick of this, you know, ridiculous thing. So um, it's stuff like that stuff that really kind of builds your character, builds your patience. And uh, you know, obviously it's still something I'm working on, not a finished product by any means, but I think, uh, just little things off the course that in college you kind of take for granted. And, you you know, you kind of sort of some, sometimes you maybe tend to complain about certain things and, and, but you don't really realize how good or how much everything's taken care of in college. Yeah. And I was going to say, obviously it's got to be challenging when you do golf for a living and you don't have your tools with you. And we all know what the frustrations of airline travel are. Uh, And I don't think a lot of people who, who aren't in the know with, with your particular situation, um, you know, none of us would know that that's something that takes place, but I've talked to a few other golfing friends I have, and um, some of them are a little bit terrified when they get on an airplane with their clubs, and they just want to make sure that, like, am I going to be in a situation where I'm in, you know, a place where I'm supposed to compete and don't have my hardware? Um, you know, how do you, how do you deal with something like that? <laughs> you know, there's not a whole lot you can do. I mean, there's only so much English you can yell to a Spanish airline when your flight, you know, like, it, it, <laughs> there's a very finite amount you can do. Uh, yeah. A lot of times you just got to got to be patient and and uh, and deal with it. I mean, I was I qualified for the for the Open Championship, the British this year, and I got uh, I was on a direct flight from Rome to Manchester, and uh, so I got into Manchester about Monday morning, seven thirty ish, eight o'clock. My clubs didn't get there till Wednesday night at nine p.m. <laughs> uh, so obviously with the tournament starting Thursday, so I uh, mm. you know I luckily all the equipment trucks were there and they were able to put together a set, but it's still not my clubs, you know, like these are are your babies, you know, you can, 
make a, a couple clones of your kids, but you know, you know, <laughs> you know what the real thing is. So, um, you know, I mean, it's just, um, yeah, it just kind of creates a lot of, a lot of trust in yourself through that adversity. And any, you know, I think more than, more than anything, you, you kind of learn a little bit about how you react to certain situations and how, how you need to handle the, them, you know, going forward. Not everybody on the tour is Bryson DeChambeau who measures their clubs to that specification. But uh, obviously when you're, when you're a professional, everything has to be, you know, a certain way. You probably go through a large tweaking process with the clubs to, you know, fit basically what you need. So, so obviously playing with just generic uh, Dick sporting goods clubs, isn't going to cut it. So. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Julian, you're, you're obviously a uh, pro golf competitor. You've won um, you know several tournaments too this year, which we're going to get into. You're a two-time winner on the Swing Thought Tour also, which is the third largest tour in the U.S. behind the PGA and Web.com tours. Uh, you then won earlier this year in the Czech Republic, and um, you know then you won the first European tour just literally, what, about a month and a half ago, not even, at the Made in Denmark um, you know, tournament there. Got it right up there on the screen. Um, you know, what, mentally, what challenges uh, or what changes uh, when you go from merely competing to win to then actually winning? on a stage like the European tour and then, you know, hopefully eventually the PGA tour as well. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, it kind of sounds, sounds maybe cliche, but I think you have to, uh, it doesn't matter what stage you're playing on or what tour, what course, or you have to maintain good habits and the habits are the sort of building block of everything. Um, whether that means you know you have a 15 minute warm up routine before you even go to the to the range to hit balls before the round or during the round when you um say you three putt a hole instead of getting pissed off you kind of f- focus it into channeling it to execute for the next hole mm-hmm. um those are those are things that you build up over time and, and but you have to police them yourself because 99% of the time, nobody's going to pick up on those things and, and tell, tell you to do that. You know, golf is a very individual game, obviously. And even with team golf, you have to be very introspective. So I think um, competing to win doesn't start when you're picking up the trophy. It starts way, way, way before that from sort of recognizing you may have sev- uh, some deficiencies and uh and trying to make yourself the most uh most efficient possible uh efficient competitor that you can um whether that means making a, a change in uh in your swing or a change in um attitude or change in uh in a response to a certain event there's there's a lot that goes into it and you really have to uh look inside um but i would say you know from winning last year on the swing thought and then the challenge it's it's all a learning process you know i i, I really I feel like I do a pretty good job of taking stock after every event on what I did well, but more importantly, what I need to improve on um, to go forward to, like I said, to get the most out of myself, to squeeze as much juice out of myself as I can. And uh, so, you know, it's all, it's a lot of it is introspective and, and just continually learning. Like I'll say, I thought when I won those swing thought events last year, I was extremely good mentally, but my swing was nowhere near where it is now. And that was probably what, 15 months ago. So it wasn't that long ago. Um, But my swing is is definitely improved. And I work a lot on that on the range, but I'd say this year, my biggest improvements have been, have been mentally um, because you're playing so many four round tournaments. Um, I don't even know how many events I've played this year, probably 16, 17, somewhere in that ballpark between the European and the challenge tour, all Mm -hmm. four day events. Um, and I think I've missed, I missed one cut on the challenge tour and I missed the British open cut both by one stroke. And so majority of those are four week events. You're going week to week. There's a lot of energy being expended, especially being in contention, which is a good thing, but being able to rebound going into the next week, sort of, uh, one example is I I learned, I got to take that Monday off. I can't, uh, especially when I'm playing four days, I'm in, you know, in the mix, it just exhausts me mentally on Sunday evening. And I just can't, uh, even if I go out there with the club Monday, it's, it's a waste of time because it's, I'm just not there. Um, so that's one example. And just, just things you kind of build up on, you learn, um, say even, uh, late in a round, you know, say you're kind of sort of stuck in neutral. Uh, I did this a couple of weeks ago in Switzerland for a specific example. I was, I was one under, I believe, uh, through, through 15 holes. Um, 
which it was okay, but the conditions weren't that tough. And sorry, I was two under and uh, ended up eagling my 16th hole, birdieing my 18th hole to finish five under, shoot 65. You know, that turns, that's, that's a big difference. It's a big yeah. momentum shift. And, and, you know, just being able to hang in there, I think I made seven or eight pars in a row in the middle of that round. Like it, it wasn't sexy at all. It wasn't fun. But you look at the end score, 65, somebody says like, oh, wow, you must have really torn it up, you know, just been on. Well, no, not really. I mean, you know, for half the round, it was fairly mediocre. You know, I was playing solid, but it wasn't anything great. But I, I kind of had learned and, and getting better at just kind of when you know you're playing well, even though you're not making birdies every hole, um, if that may be, you just got to keep plugging away. Just keep, you know, keep your head down and keep executing. And, and that's kind of uh, been another thing that I've learned. So this, you know, I know I've been babbling a little bit, but this whole competing to win thing, like I said, it really starts at a, at a very low kind of foundation you keep building on it and i'm still building on it and you know even the top guys in the world are building on it and that's just how you how you improve and the stage just changes automatically but when you're so focused on improving yourself you don't really notice it i, I feel like yeah no it's certainly not babbling along because i wanted the focus of the conversation today to be preparation you couldn't have segued into that topic any better than you just did um you know, if you can, um, just a little bit for us, you know, how would you describe the Julian Surrey philosophy on preparation, not just your game, but with your daily life? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I've definitely now, especially this year, I've definitely valued a little bit more of rest time. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, being able to take Monday off. But I think working, working smart, being efficient is, is, is so much more important. Uh, you know, I think, uh, but when I, when I do decide that I'm going to prepare, or I'm going to work at something, I put everything I have into it. There's no, you know, when I'm playing a pro-am or a practice round, I turn the phone off, put it in the bag. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no uh, selfies being taken or, you know, any of that, you know, I'm, I'm there to do what I came to do. I didn't travel from Florida to Switzerland to, you know, <laughs> do stuff, you know, do ridiculous things, you know? So I think, you know, just kind of being, being present and being like where I am, that's been a, that's been a big, a big thing just to conserve energy and just to um, try to be at my best. Um, when I'm home, I pretty much go all out. I don't really have a whole lot of off time. I'll take a couple of days off. Like I told you, I took two days off here. Yeah. The most I'll take is four or five days off, but I'm definitely, when I get home, I'm very excited to kind of practice and work on the, uh, a lot of things, the physical things that I've noticed, uh, weaknesses in over the last few events. So, um, so it's, it's, it's almost like, um, kind of a release and it's al almost a little therapeutic really to get back into it. And then, uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I know where I want to be in the game and, you know, I know this whole continually, this process of continually getting better will take me there. So obviously you had a huge moment, uh, just a little bit over a month ago, you won the made in Denmark. Like I said, you say that becoming a champion, obviously the preparation starts long before the trophy, but I want to kind of break it down a little bit. I believe you went to that final round with David Horsey with the lead. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you, had uh, a I was two back. You're two back. So, yeah. so, you're in the final round with David Horsey, who had won the event two years prior, and you shoot a 64 in the final round. Um, so, you know, whether it's going into the final round with the lead or trailing, like you said, um, you know, I'm sure you've, you've had both situations. Describe what it is like on a Sunday. You know, take us through your routine from waking up in the morning. Um, you know, tell us, if, is it any different if you're trailing versus when you're in the lead? But, you know, what's that final round routine like, and how do you take your way through it? Um, yeah, I mean the final round routine, you know, it's, um, honestly the biggest difference on Sunday as opposed to the other days is you got to pack all your stuff up and mm. leave with the suitcase. <laughs> uh, you're not going to be there that night. So, um, but other than that, I mean, you know, I, I've, uh, on that day, I believe my time, my tea time was right around lunchtime, which yeah. I'm a huge, my metabolism is very fast. So I, I get very hangry when I don't have enough food. So I, I think when my time is usually between 11 and 12, it's a little bit awkward for me because I have to kind of either have a late breakfast or figure out when lunch is going to be. And, and so, um, I think my time was right around 12 that day. So I left, uh, 
I left a little bit earlier. I think I got a card about 9.30. Um, and uh, so I practiced a little bit putting before because of that time. Got there about two hours early, putted for about 30 minutes, and then had to try to eat as much as I can for lunch. Mm -hmm. It's an early lunch. But uh, for me, the eating part is huge. Pick up a couple sandwiches from the course um, and then uh, and then get back into the routine with probably about 45 minutes left or so. Um, hit some balls and then hit a couple putts before heading out on the tee. And the whole time just trying to uh, get myself as mentally prepared as I can for, for the day. Um, as opposed to leading or, or going, you know, uh, with a couple of stroke or two behind, I, I think uh, it doesn't really make a difference as far as before the round. Because um, I know during the round, it doesn't matter if you're leading by five or six strokes. You still got to go out and execute the shots on every on every hole. So there's no, uh, you know, until I have a little bit of a cushion, like I did walking down the 18th fairway. There's no let up. So either way, I know it's going to be a battle, and I got to keep pushing and keep grinding until uh, until I earn it. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the first gesture I think you made as soon as you won, I'll put it up on the screen, was you, uh, you know, kind of showing what you got right there. Um, you know. What, what was going through your mind when, you know, obviously this is the culmination of a lot of goals that you've had is, is winning on the stage, but, you know, you know, kind of describe this mentality, you know, that's obviously your first movement right there. You know, maybe you had something to prove to yourself, maybe you had something to prove to others, but you know, what, when, when you make that putt on 18, you know that you're now a professional champion on Europe's highest tour, you know, what's the, what's the mindset? Um, you know, that, that, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I, I've always kind of prided myself on being, mentally strong and I think um coming from my where I was at the beginning of this year you know and, and then winning on the challenge tour and kind of being on the top of the money list for a while and and then you know being able to bring that to the European tour I feel like that that was a pretty good sign of mental strength so that that flex was was more um sort of an expression of that I'd say I love it I mean like I said it's a uh, I, I love it <laughs> yeah and you know I think uh you know I think the crowd had a decent time with it too but I think uh it was uh th that's where that's where that came from but you know I, I'm I've always been pretty ex expressive I think most people you can tell by my body language or my facial expressions whether I like a shot or I'm in a in a good um you know a good space mentally I guess but uh it's uh no that's uh maybe it'll be a trademark i don't know going forward it's not a bad thing i uh i need to continue my work in the gym though that's for sure to make that a uh an attractive uh, a pose i guess that's a great segue as well because we are the fit click so i'd be remiss if i didn't discuss fitness at some point obviously it's part of your preparation describe your fitness regimen and how would you say it differs now from when you were in college or maybe even earlier this year how has it kind of evolved over time uh, especially now that you're a champion. <laughs> yeah, well, I think in uh, in college, I really started to get into it, especially into the into the strength part more. Um, I was a lot of times I was very I had a couple bad experiences with it early on in high school and whatever, and with strength training and and kind of being um, you know being an athlete really. So I think uh, I had a really good strength coach my last uh, two years at Duke, and he's still one of my good friends. I still talk to him all the time, ask him for advice. And so that sort of influence, I think, had a really positive uh, effect on me when I left college. And I've kind of always been very diligent with it. And then uh, just in the past couple of months, I've worked, uh, started working with a trainer here in Jacksonville. Uh, his name is Keith McCormick. He's a uh, TPI certified and everything. And, and uh, me and my brother have been going to him. And, uh, you know, he's really emphasized it's just, a, it's just a lot of stuff. You know, I've, I've always been very flexible in certain parts of my hamstrings and, and, you know, my, my sort of rotation has been very good, but my hips have been stiff, uh, internally and externally rotating. And, uh, so that's something he's really harped on me and I, I continue to work on a lot. Um, and then the strength stuff, uh, you know, I've always had speed. That's never been an issue, but sometimes being able to decelerate and, and, uh, keep everything in control, that's something, I could, I could be better at. So, um, you know, it's just kind of, uh, ever evolving thing, but you know, it's definitely something I'm really committed to. And, and on the road of, especially in the last couple of months, um, it's a little easier on the European tour than the challenge truck because the facilities are there. You have the physio truck. A lot of the times the hotel you stay in has a, as a, you know, functional hotel or sorry, functional gym. And, um, 
so it's a little bit more available and it's a little easier to keep up on your routine. Um, and I've definitely made an extra effort to, to do, to make that, uh, especially early in the week, I try to focus more on strength stuff. And then, uh, and then later in the week, definitely with the warm ups and the cool downs. And then obviously, like I said, the hip mobility, range of, range of motion stuff and, and, um, just kind of feeling, feeling solid. You know, I like, uh, what's one thing to just stretch all day, but you know, I, I want to feel strong and supple and, and feel like I can really, uh, you know, be aggressive through the ball. You know, if you can, Julian, for a second, and I, I'm, you know, I work in the field and uh, I'm going for TPI uh, later this year, actually myself, but, you know, describe from your standpoint, the mind body connection with the golf swing, you have a nice real tempo on your backswing. It's pretty slow. And then it's very, very explosive at impact. Um, you know, describe when you're, when you're out on the course, what's going through your head mentally. And then, you know, how does that translate to the actual swing itself? Uh, you know, me- mechanics wise, I, I like to not think about too much on the course. Um, you know, I think uh, so much of the preparation is on the external stuff. You have, you have the weather and you have the, whatever wind is the yardage, obviously ele- any elevation uh, where the pin is, all that stuff. So, it, so much of it is just on stuff that's already there. Yeah. Um, and you kind of just play the situation. Um, so, uh, as far as technical stuff, you, that work's already been done. Yeah. You know, there's a very, there's a limit to how much you can actually change or whatever <laughs> effect on that. But I'd say the, the one thing I really harp on is, uh, hitting my shots. You know, if I hit my shot and if I execute the way I want to, yeah. um, you know, and I've told people this, it, it, if I execute that the way I want to, I feel like I can birdie it every hole on the course. And, uh, you know, so that, that, that really takes a lot of, um, it takes, I don't know if you call it, uh, if you call it pressure or if you call it whatever baggage, I guess, external baggage about worrying about other stuff because you worry about what other guys are doing or you worry about, uh, uh, you know, I got screwed with this wave because this this weather was tougher than the morning wave or blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff that guys say. And, you know, a lot of it is just it means nothing, honestly, yeah. um, because when you bring it back to where I feel like I can do, I can accomplish anything on a golf course when I just execute the way I want to, um, that kind of takes care of everything. So that's that's really uh, and obviously having the proper fitness level. Uh, to keep the amount of energy to be able to execute for four and a half, five hours, or even more so if there's delays and you got to play 30 holes in a day or whatever, um, or in adverse conditions when it's raining or, you know, there's a lot more that goes into it. Mm-hmm. That's also a big part of it. Obviously, that's a big part of why I train, you know, off the course and stuff. But um, a big, uh, but for me, it's it's just all about execution. You know, that's, that's where it is. And uh you know, if it doesn't matter what the weather's like or what anybody else is doing, if you're not executing your shots, you're not going to, you, maybe the result will end up okay for the day, but you know, you're definitely not, uh, getting the most out of yourself. Yeah. Execution is everything. Like you said, you can have the best, we talked about preparation. That's really important, but if you don't get down and, and execute, then, then the score will be the score. Yep. Julian, what is the most valuable lesson you've learned over the past five years? I could even say just this year, since you've done so much and so much has happened. But, you know, over the last five years, what would you say is the most valuable thing you've learned in this process? Valuable lesson. You know, I, I, you know, there's been quite a bit. Obviously, there's always ups and downs with 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 golf, especially but with anything that you're pursuing. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's. uh <clears throat> You have, like I said, through the ups and downs, you have people who stick with you. And I think uh, as now, you know, it's been down, it was down for a little bit. Now it's obviously, you know, my, my stuff is a little bit on the rise. And, and there's all sorts of people that kind of um, come, into the, come into the game. And, uh, and, you know, there's you gain a lot of new friends in the last couple of months. And, and so I think, uh, you know, just being able to sort of stay grounded and, and uh, realize uh you know what uh what got you there in the first place and not uh not change too many things up because like i said we were talking about preparation earlier you know you know i know what works for me and mm-hmm. while you know that's always you know a, a changing process and, and evaluating after the fact 
getting ready for a round or for a tournament or for a stretch of events or getting ready for something important. Um, you know, there's a process that you've gone through that's worked for a reason. So there's really no reason to uh, really alter that too much or, or, or even alter the people around you unless that's something that you feel needs a significant change. But I think um, just kind of being true to yourself and kind of knowing um, – staying grounded really i mean that's that's the biggest thing i, I feel um you have a lot of guys who feel like they're you know they can walk on water now and everything because they've won and they can kind of chill out a little bit but i've never you know i've always kind of lived like i said with getting the most out of myself so just because an example of that would be you know just because i won a month ago and i have a two-year exemption I'd be like oh you know now i can put my feet up and kind of enjoy and go uh rent a rent a yacht for a week and you know just chill out in the middle of the season i was like no that's not i can't live with myself doing stuff like that so you know just um kind of keeping the same mindset and keep the same habits and and um keep keep pushing you know i've had a lot of really amazing people on the show and one thing that a lot of these guys you know, have won millions and have made a lot of money but the number one thing they all say is that they have an attitude of gratitude and that they never take any of it for granted. And even after they win, it just makes them want to win even more. It's almost like kind of an addictive part of their preparation. And, you know, okay, so I won a lot of money. Well, you know, at the moment I'm doing this for the money and not for, you know, becoming better or having a better outcome than I had last time, then it's really time to hang it up and find something else to do. You know, how easy do you find humility in the situation you're in? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think uh... – yeah, it's definitely a delicate balance because, you know, as a competitor and athlete and someone, you, you yeah. take great pride in what you do and how hard you work. And, and so there's, there's a balance, you know, I, I definitely have a, have a big ego when it comes to my golf, but you know, I, I feel like there's so much left, uh, to, to achieve. I mean, there's so much, you know, in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, the, I'm not even close to, to where I've come a long way, certainly in the last year. But there's still so much, you know, that that I've kind of left left to do, you know, in my eyes, and and uh, and then that's just in golf. And then you look at off the course and how kind of um, in the grand scheme of things, how unimportant golf is, as opposed to uh, you know, you look at life in general all around the world, and you have people who have very real issues and very uh, you know life and death things, and you know, I'm I'm concentrating 90%. I'm lucky enough to concentrate so much of my time and my energy on, on a sport. Um, so, right. you know, it's almost like on different levels, almost like an inception thing where it's just like, uh, you know, you, I, within the game of golf, I still feel like there's so much left to achieve. And then once you kind of are, are done with that or whatever on a whole nother level, you know, there's so you're, you're in a, as it is, you're in a, I'm in a very fortunate position. So, um, you know, just kind of being able to step back and take a look at the, at the forest instead of concentrating on the trees every once in a while, you know? No, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. Julian Surrey, my guest today on the fit click, Julian, it's been a real pleasure having you. Sorry for the uh, technical issue there. Occasionally it happens. Uh, you can tune in and check out all of Julian's content and see where he's at at his Instagram. Just don't check it out during a tournament. Cause like you said, he puts the, uh, the phone in the bag and, and doesn't pull it out during the pro-ams and the tournaments. But, uh, you know, he's got a lot of great stuff on there and obviously he's doing a lot of great things um, on the other side of the pond for the most part right now. Maybe eventually he gets over here on this side. Um, and then also check out European Tour. Um, PGA Tour and European Tour, i got to say, have really awesome Instagram pages. I follow the stories regularly and the way they interview the players. And I'm like, this is the most engaging Instagram story from any account that I follow on a regular basis. Yeah. I was pretty blown away by uh, how interactive it is. They, they've hired some good people to run those handles. Yeah, definitely. So, um, and then you can also check out europeantour.com for Julian's schedule. Check out all the different tournaments coming up on their circuit at europeantour.com. I've been following regularly and, uh, you know, like I said, some beautiful courses over there in Switzerland and Denmark. And I know now they've got the Portugal Masters going on. Um, you know, you're, you're off this week, but, uh, you know, certainly a great-looking tournament there as well. And then check out my Instagram for all upcoming episodes of the Fit Click. Check out this episode later today on both the YouTube and later on today also on the podcast. Any parting shots of any kind of the Fit Click audience? Uh, about be, preparation, about winning. You know, I mean, I think, uh, you, you know, a lot of these things can be, 
you have ups and downs, like I said, and it can be very discouraging, but I think, you know, perseverance is the most important quality of, of, uh, of anything. And, you know, just, uh, if you have a goal and you, you know, you, you kind of have, a you create a path to sort of start achieving that goal and, um, just don't let anything kind of, kind of get in the way of that. I think that's the biggest, uh, the biggest key for sure. Versus, I was watching the founder with Michael Keaton the other night at the McDonald's story and given I don't eat McDonald's and I don't really stand by much of their health stuff. It is very about, uh, he says it right there at the end. He said, persistence, perseverance is everything. So, um, yeah. For Julian Suri, I'm Chris Doherty. This has been the Fit Click. Check out for the podcast later on tonight on iTunes and also on YouTube at the Chris Doherty Fitness YouTube page. Um, Julian, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, of course, Chris. Absolutely. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. It's always fun. Take care and have a great one. Thanks. For all episodes of the Fit Click, check us out both on iTunes and YouTube. Connect with Chris and his guests by liking the Chris Doherty Fitness Facebook page and by following him on Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter using the Chris Doherty Fit handle.